Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. So here we are just about 100 days into the Biden administration. And so our topic today is Democrats face a major test of unity on next health care steps. And my guest today is Jeff Manville. Jeff leads government affairs for Mercer. Thanks for joining me today, Jeff. Well, it's always great to be with you, Tracy. Thanks a lot. So Jeff, let's just start at a high level. What health policies do you think are most likely to be advanced by Congress in legislation? Well, it's pretty clear that whatever advances, it'll be what Democrats want, right? I mean, they're determined to continue taking full advantage of Senate control by using the budget reconciliation rules uh, to push their agenda forward without having to worry about Republican opposition or, or any filibusters. And that's, of course, what they did last month in, in pushing through the American Rescue Plan Act uh, and its COBRA subsidies and temporary expansion of ACA subsidies in the, in the individual market. Um, the next round of Democratic proposals will be carried by this massive uh, infrastructure proposal that was just introduced by the president last week. We don't know yet what you know, health policies will be included in that plan, but the president is about to release uh, what's being called a human capital infrastructure plan that should give Congress some direction on health policy. But I do think it will, at a minimum, call for you know, making those more generous ACA subsidies permanent um, and we'll need to watch for any changes to the employer shared responsibility rules as part of that, that ACA proposal. We're not getting any signal right now that that's in the cards, but you know, we're on guard. And then drug pricing, I think, is a good bet, too. There's, you know, these drug pricing proposals raise a lot of money to pay for other things they're going to need in this infrastructure bill. And they poll well with the public. And then, of course, progressives are pushing for uh, things like a government-run public option plan and lowering uh, the Medicare eligibility age. So we'll see other proposals to be sure, but I think that's that's the high-level list right now. So I realize these are all predictions, and I want to come back to prescription drugs in just a minute, but is there anything that you would put on the least likely list to happen in Congress? Well, if anyone's still wondering, I think Medicare for all is off the table. Um, even though it still gets a lot of strong support from the progressive wing of the party. I uh, remember during the presidential campaign, uh, Biden really touted the public option as an alternative to Medicare for all. So um, that's not happening. But um, And I think any expansion of Medicare, including lowering the eligibility age, is something of a long shot, given that the pandemic has pushed up you know, Medicare's projected insolvency a few years to uh, into 2024. I think the public option also faces a steep climb, even if Biden comes out in support for it. But, um, you know, it's going to run into fierce opposition for much of the healthcare industry. We know that. Uh, but this is going to be interesting, Tracy. I, I think, particularly in the employer plan space, I think the ground might be shifting a little bit. You know, employer groups, as you know, have traditionally opposed the public option for fear it you know, undermines the private system. But I think at this point, there are some employer groups that are just so fed up with rising costs that they're warming up to the idea. And you know, some of these public option bills in Congress give employers access to the public option. So this is gonna be an interesting debate going forward. Yeah, and you know, on the public option, some of the states are going to take a, a, a run at doing that. We know that in Washington state, um, they launched Cascade Care starting in January. And so, you know, we're, we're going to have a couple of um, state experiments to, to pay attention to along the way. Um, I want to go back to prescription drugs. From the survey that we did right after the election, managing prescription drug prices was the most desired health policy action by employers. And so I'm just curious, do you have any specific ideas on what Congress might do to address prescription drug pricing and what will that mean to employer sponsored plans? 
Well, we do have an idea of what Democrats are thinking. I think the first thing they're going to tee up is this uh, bill that um, actually passed the House in the last Congress, and it's widely known by its uh, number designation, HR3, uh, was introduced by Speaker Pelosi, and it would let Medicare negotiate prices for certain high cost drugs, and then notably make those negotiated prices available to employer plans. Um, uh, so we'll have to see how that idea evolves this year and then sort of assess the implications for employer plan plans as this goes along, but um, at least they're thinking about us, uh, right? So we have to watch for cost shifting on that front, but that's the big idea I think Democrats will lead with on drug pricing. And um, do you think that uh, a lot of that interest will be driven by the savings that are associated with doing that? Could you just talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office scores the, uh, the Medicare negotiation piece uh, as saving the government about a $450 billion over 10 years. I mean, you know, close to half a trillion dollars, even in Washington, that's a lot of money. So that is super attractive uh, for, uh, for lawmakers. And then the making those negotiated prices available to employer plans would save um, employers about $12 billion over 10 years. That's a nice little chunk of, of savings there. So, um, so yeah, raises a ton of money. Um, and, um, and as I said, it, it pulls really, really well with the public and they, they are really clamoring to see Congress do something to get control of healthcare costs. And as we all know, you know, drug prices are the leading component of that, I think right now. Yeah, I was really happy to see that they were projecting savings for employers. If they had not included that, I would have been very skeptical about um, some of the proposals that they're scoring. So I want to end on kind of the what we, where we started out with the title of this, and that you know Democrats face this major test of unity on making all of this happen. And so, you know, what are the challenges that Democrats face? Talk about this challenge of unity. Yeah, well, um, I think there are two main challenges. I mean, I think the first is the political challenge of trying to balance the demands of moderates and progressives and kind of keep the party together with such tight margins. I mean, remember, it's a 50-50 Senate. So without any Republican support, they can't lose a single vote. Now, they pulled that off in passing the American Rescue Plan Act, which was pretty astounding, I think, that they did it so quickly and kept, you know, the, the, the caucus in lockstep. But the second time around is going to be a lot more difficult. I think, you know, it's not just COVID-related emergency stuff. It's much broader than that. And it's, you know, leaders are going to have a lot of wish lists to try to juggle. Uh, so that's, so, you know, that's tough with the margins. And then, you know, the margin point up, the uh, procedural challenge they face in trying to do reform under budget reconciliation rules. Um, and I assume they're going to go the reconciliation route. Um, for the moment, I'm going to assume they're not going to get rid of the filibuster. Um, that would still be difficult with just 50 votes uh, in the Senate. But at any rate, the, the budget reconciliation rules are a fantastic tool in some ways for the majority party in a polarized Congress. Uh, but it doesn't work for legislation that doesn't have a direct effect on the federal budget. And that really limits the scope of the policies you can pursue through reconciliation, um, you know, if you can get a bill to the president's desk. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's a very imperfect tool for that. So um, political procedural challenges ahead, to be sure. So last question, any predictions on the timing for this um, next uh, package, this next appropriations bill? Well, I think it'll be much later in the year. That's what we're all sort of looking at as a timetable. I mean, it's gonna take time for Congress to first approve a budget resolution. You need to do that first before you can move to the reconciliation process. And that involves setting overall spending targets. And that's gonna to be tough within the Democratic caucus 
two, and it always is. And then there's you know so-called voterama in the Senate, where which goes on for days and eats up a lot of precious floor time. But bottom line, and then the committees have to act. So bottom line, I think the final votes on this might not happen until much later in the year, maybe around Thanksgiving or or even later. It's going to take a while to to pull all this together. Okay, well, thank you. We always appreciate your insights and, and for um, the employers that are watching, um, sounds like we need to keep an eye on um, anything related to prescription drugs that's going on with the Congress. Um, there might be some other things as well, but, um, but that will definitely be one that we'll all be watching. And um, Jeff, thank you. We'll have you back um, soon, I'm sure, as we have more developments. And um, thanks everyone for tuning in.